Good afternoon. Welcome to the panel on the constitutional dilemmas of big tech. Uh, I am Anupam Chander. I'm a professor at UC Davis. Uh, I'll be joining the Georgetown Law Faculty this summer. Um, so two months ago, Mark Zuckerberg spoke before the US Congress. Um, I believe you all remember that moment. Um, show of hands, how many people remember that? Um, so he spoke for two days. Uh, he was grilled um, uh, ineffectively, uh, uh, according to some accounts. Um, but then does anyone remember who was grilled the day after Zuckerberg spoke? So it was uh, your new Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. So the, he the Senate hearings, the confirmation hearings for Mike Pompeo were the day after Zuckerberg spoke. But as the audience uh, uh, response suggests, much of public attention was directed towards our real Secretary of State, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> right. uh, and so that suggests to you the enormous depth of importance that what uh, big technology companies are doing to American civic life and really to um, public life across the world. Um, so the, C the CEO of Facebook uh, and who he is and what he believes are in fact of greater public interest, maybe not important truly, but a public interest than the American Secretary of State. So, and indeed, three of the most consequential decisions of the US Supreme Court this year involve or revolve around the internet. Uh, the Microsoft Ireland dispute um, tested the extent of US surveillance powers across borders. Um, and that case led to a rare congressional law uh, designed to resolve it, right? Uh, in incredibly rare uh, at this moment. Um, um, and a related case, uh, Carpenter v. US, um, ha will test now the, the long-standing doctrines related to uh, Fourth Amendment and third parties um, and uh, information released to third parties. So that case we'll discuss in this panel. Justice Sotomayor's concurrence in US v. Jones had anticipated the issue raised, uh, presented by the Carpenter decision. And I don't know if you've just come, uh, I hope most of you had the opportunity to see Justice Sotomayor and Professor Melissa Murray uh, in, in conversation, but it was a marvelous event. event. Uh, a third case, South Dakota v. Uh, Wayfair, asked whether states can demand out-of-state sellers collect sales taxes on their behalf consistent with the Commerce Clause. And don't worry, panelists, I am not <laughs> going to. Uh, so I've just struck fear in my panelists by, uh, by mentioning this. But just to keep the, the Constitution meets big tech uh, you know, going, uh, uh, the Commerce Clause, of course, intersects in this way. And we might well have uh, a reconsideration of essentially a 50-year-old rule uh, related to the, the understanding of the US Commerce Clause again, precipitated by its, uh, the meeting of the US Constitution with the internet. So, and if the Commerce Clause has thus far fended off um, much of state regulation with respect to taxes uh, of, uh, of uh, internet companies, well, there's a clause that I haven't mentioned yet. Um, it's the First Amendment that is perhaps more, most critical of all. Uh, the First Amendment has proved invaluable to, uh, uh, to Silicon Valley and the rise of the internet. But at the same time, questions of hate speech and um, the manipulation of preferences online have, have driven much of the news from daily uh, accounts of, of near daily accounts of, uh, of kind of mismanagement of data uh, to, to the, uh, to uh, intentional manipulations by bots uh, and others who want to wreak havoc. Uh, so we've seen a tremendous amount of interest uh, with respect to the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Commerce Clause, uh, et cetera, uh, with, when it comes to the internet. And a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, Judge Naomi Buchwald of the Southern District of New York ruled that uh, the POTUS had to 
uh, could not could no longer block individuals on Twitter, right? So questions of public forums existing in the ether uh, have, have now come into uh, into uh, actual consideration. Uh, so we have with us an, an uh, incredible panel, uh, 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 leading authorities. Uh, so let me begin um, with, uh, uh, I'll begin on the far side with David. Uh, David uh, Bitcower is a partner at Jenner and Block uh, in its privacy and cybersecurity practice. He's a graduate of Harvard Law School. He served as Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division at the Department of Justice. Uh, next to uh, David is Britton Heller. She is Director of Technology and Society at the Anti-Defamation League. She is a graduate of Yale Law School. Um, next to Britton is Hassan Ali, a senior attorney at Microsoft, where he oversees global lawful access policy and manages law enforcement issues for, for Microsoft. He's a graduate of uh, BU Law School, uh, where my friend Angela Nwachi Willing is now just joined as dean. Um, and so uh, he previously served as senior counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee, where he worked on the USA Freedom Act. Uh, dean Litsky, Larissa Litsky, is dean at the University of Missouri School of Law, uh, where she's been serving for a year. Uh, she's a graduate of the University of Texas, and she previously served as associate dean at Florida. Um, and so our format is as follows. I'm going to ask uh, a set of questions to our panelists. Uh, so this is not a set of five different speakers, uh, you know, with a lot, a certain amount of time allotted to them. Rather, we're going to be engaging each other. Uh, feel free to interrupt me and ask each other questions as well. Um, uh, and then we'll turn it over to you. So please prepare your Q and A, uh, your questions uh, for the last Q and A. A session, uh, which will be the last half hour of this of this uh, panel. A couple things: please turn off your cell phones. Um, please also tweet this session using the hashtag uh, ACS2018. Um, it would be sad to have an internet session that had no tweets associated with it. Uh, so uh, if it doesn't happen on Twitter, it doesn't happen. Uh, to borrow, uh, to modify Melissa Murray's uh, statement this afternoon. Okay, so, uh, and finally, most importantly, if you need CLE credit, go back outside and make sure that you've scanned in to get your CLE credit. Okay. So let me begin uh, the questions. Uh, Dean Litsky, uh, more and more of our lives are being governed by algorithms. Algorithms are making decisions related to our credit, our, uh, what stuff we see online, what offers we get. Um, uh, and they're also you know, sometimes saying things that are rude or, or improper. Um, how, do, how should we approach these things? Uh, do algorithms have free speech rights? Um, what, you know, can we be defamed by algorithms? Uh, what are your thoughts on this issue? Well, so, so that's a, both of those are potentially broad questions, but, but the first one is one that's been kicked around uh, since the beginning, is what is the nature of big companies like Google and Facebook? Are they mere conduits? And uh, if so, they have limited liability for content generated by their users. It's not mandated by the First Amendment but that they be treated as conduits, and yet in 1996, Congress passed the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, that gives uh, internet service providers broad immunity for content posted by their users. And so some would argue that was absolutely crucial to the growth and burgeoning of the internet, that they were, they were threatened by uh, they were threatened by some early decisions treating them as publishers that might have shut down the vitality and growth of the internet. But even some of the people that advocated the breadth of the Communications Decency Act immunity under Section 230 are now saying, well, they're, they're big boys now. Just like the railroads got some breaks from negligence law in the 19th century, but then the industry matured and we started imposing uh, uh, regulation in light of the harm caused, that now maybe we should cut back on some of the broad immunity because it's no longer uh, necessary. And we have 
a, a, a minor curtailing um, now for sex trafficking in uh, the SESTA Act that just came out uh, pretty recently. And so there are continued calls for Google and Facebook to take on more editorial responsibilities to prevent harm from things like Facebook. Uh, but we've we, we've yet to see you know whether the conduit treatment is going to be carved back on further, and even if it is, there's a controversy if you're going to treat them like instead of a tech company, a media company. What's the right media paradigm? Should they be treated like newspaper publishers, or should they be treated like distributors of content, where they're only liable with uh, if they're given notice of the problematic content, uh, have a chance to review it and take it down. And that's really the, the kind of regime that most uh, European countries and other countries in the world have taken is a notice and take down type, type regime for problematic or harmful content. So the question about notice and take down regimes, of course, is that once the entity gets notice, um, the worry is that the initial legal uh, judgment will always be to take it down, right? Because there's little incentive um, economically to keep it up and legal liability if you take it down. That is, the, there's a one way, the liability regime only counsels in one way, which is take it down, because otherwise if I, if I leave it up, I have exposure. If I take it down, I have no exposure. Well, uh, certainly that is a risk, but there's, there's a new article called uh, Surveillance Intermediaries, and uh, the, the professor's name is Rosen, Rosenstein, and he's at Minnesota. And he argues that, that that is the common argument, but in fact, the, media, the, the companies like Google and Facebook themselves have some incentives to keep their market, not to just have knee-jerk takedown. And I think we have enough data now from considerations. I mean, we do have a notice and takedown regime in the United States for copyright law. And we also have the, the global right to be forgotten uh, in the European Union. And so we have experience watching what gets taken down by Google uh, under the right to be forgotten law. And they've taken down about 43% of the 2.4 million requested uh, URLs requested to be taken down. So they're clearly not taking, taking down everything, but there certainly is a tremendous danger of censorship, and, and especially censorship without transparency. We don't know what's getting taken down and why. I fear that powerful people will be much more able to sanitize information about themselves under those regimes than, than the powerless. Britton, do you have any thoughts on this kind of t notice and takedown systems that are being proposed here? Yes, uh, the, the feedback that we've been getting from European advocacy groups is that they, um, some privacy-oriented groups are very unhappy with how this regime has been implemented because they say that their individual monitoring has shown that it has been over-suppressing legitimate speech. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. um, the advocates who are in favor of, um, of combating hate speech and taking a harder stance against the companies are very happy with it and they're doing their own beta testing to see what actually makes it through the filters and what doesn't. So it seems like the NGO sector on the European front is kind of at loggerheads about whether or not they think this is a good idea or not and whether or not the data shows it's effective or ineffective. Hassan? So the one other thing I would add to this is that I think there's a separate layer um, about what, what service we're actually talking about. And I think you know mm -hmm. when we when we look at Microsoft, right? We have um, we don't have a very large social media presence, but we do have kind of an affirmative community that we're taking that we're creating on Xbox, for example, right? And there we have terms of service. We have other um, kind of policies and procedures within Microsoft to facilitate and foster that type of gaming environment. Um, when we talk about other types of services like search engines, right, or broader social media platforms like Twitter, um, the debate obviously gets more complicated and more complex. So when we're thinking about through these issues, I think we have to also think about what exactly we're talking about. And the internet is not this big monolith. Companies are not this big monolith. And even within individual companies, how we address the problem 
can be easy in one circumstance and very, very difficult in another, and even more complicated when there's potential legal liability added to that. Yeah. So I was thinking about Project Maven by Google, right? Uh, you saw this week that, last week, that uh, Google retreated from uh, providing uh, kind of training uh, drone AI uh, uh, site so that it can identify objects on the ground. Um, uh, so there was a rebellion within Google. Google decided to no longer participate in this project. But at the same time, Google has now announced AI ethics policies, etc. Google isn't going to stop providing Google Docs to, to uh, the government. It's not going to uh, stop providing Google Search to the government. Um, there, what the product is really does matter in this context, right? What exactly the service is matters. It's not just, uh, you know, do you provide um, do you stop providing any service at all to the U.S. military? Right, and I, I actually, you, you, you've taken the conversation exactly mm -hmm. where, I, where I wanted to take it as well, which is, mm -hmm. you know, at some on some level, when we talk about the large-scale computing and analytical power that companies like Microsoft, Google, Facebook all have, um, based off of the user information that they're giving to us or they're contributing to our services, um, that certainly is a is a problem when we're talking about using that type of analytical tools directly by the government, right? So. Um, and there are certain issues and complications there that I think Google is struggling with and we within Microsoft are struggling with exactly what that means and how to do it. Um, and you know, we see that of course with Project Maven. We also see that um, in the recent kind of facial recognition issue in Orlando. Um, but for me, the more challenging question, and I think one that hasn't swung around quite yet, is when can the government compel a private actor to use its own computing power and and then you know, send information back to the government. So when we talk about kind of the government's procurement policies and everything like that, that's certainly an issue. That's certainly an issue that's right for discussion with, on the Hill, within policymakers, within companies on who to sell to. Um, but in some sense, it could not even matter, right? So if you take, for example, um, you know, at Facebook or in other social media companies, you have suggested friends, right, that you've probably all seen kind of scary how accurate that is. Um, but when can the government actually send legal process over to a company and say, okay, we actually want that type of information. What type of legal process is required, right? And I think that's a threshold question. Do we want those type of analytical tools um, being at the disposal of the government? And I think these are questions for policymakers that no one's really struggled with yet. And fortunately, um, that issue hasn't swung around just yet, right? So law enforcement is not required to access to this, but you can certainly can do so. So. so on Facebook, um, uh, I recently had a friend, we're buying a house uh, in DC, and uh, we have a financial uh, agent here who's providing the bank loan, and Facebook suggested her as, my, as a Facebook friend, right? I've never actually physically met her, um, but uh, it, it was kind of interesting to figure out like where, what was the algorithmic uh, connection there. Um, yes, Larissa. I just wanted to say on the last topic is, you know, all legal, re I always tell my students, all legal reasoning proceeds by analogy. And um, one of the analogies that you might draw in these cases where uh, the government is trying to turn Google or Microsoft into an investigative arm of the government is we have some precedent with that with people who investigate routinely, and that's journalists. And so ironically, these arguments about those uh, data processing tools might be might create more of an argument that Google and Microsoft are media companies in a way that might give them some protections by analogy to the protections we've developed for confidential sources of, of journalists. Uh, another thing related to this is um, in the civil rights field we always talk about how the work we're doing with tech companies is like looking through the keyhole. Mm -hmm. And if tech companies are very eager to stave off regulation that everybody thinks will be coming in the wake of Cambridge Analytica, uh, something that we've been asking them to do is to provide more access to information to help rebuild public trust and allow civil society-based groups and journalists and other watchdogs to verify some of the claims that they've been made. Mm -hmm. um, some of the claims that they've been making, which we think would, um, would be a really good first step but at this point, um, the, um, the center that I run has been doing artificial intelligence-based work on looking at hateful speech and creating definitions of what hateful speech looks like from the perspective of targeted groups. Mm -hmm. So um, 
And so what about the use of algorithms mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to target that hate speech? Uh, should we be concerned that the algorithms, are, algorithms can't really tell that this is truly hateful or if it's kind of ironic, um, you know, um, you know, even our president doesn't understand the word what irony is. Uh, if you if you follow his Twitter well, account this week, uh, yes. But, uh, but uh, so, uh, how do we teach uh, algorithms to identify hate speech, etc.? You need really good data sets, and that goes back to to the question of is data a public good? Is mm -hmm. access to this information, if if like Jack Balkan says tech companies are going to be information intermediaries, if we, if we view this as a potential public good. Um, if, if you ever, so there are lots of bots, we're gonna talk about bots later. Do you ever feel like you're trying to, re, when you're rebooking a flight and you're talking to the AI bot who's helping you rebook your flight, do you ever feel like they're trying to cheat you or they're lying a little bit? If you do, there may be a reason for this where the, the AI training set that is most commonly used to train um, chat bots and email response bots comes from the 1.4 million emails that were ordered disclosed in the Enron case. So if you're thinking about what, um, what AI does, it identifies mm -hmm. patterns across the system. And so when you think about the corpus of that email and what it was used to prove and now what it's being used to train an automated system to do, it's, it's a little troubling. So, uh, so is that why it shreds all your reservations? That is and definitely why it shreds all my reservations. <laughs> So, so with yeah. ours, um, what we've been trying to do is to think about how we want companies to engage with this information. So we're not trying to create a definition of what hate speech is or is not. And we don't want companies to do that, but we want them to respond to user concerns. So the AI is being developed by hand training from undergrads at UC Berkeley working with the D-Lab, and they are identifying whether or not um, a certain comment from these 10,000 we pulled off of Reddit count as hateful or not hateful speech based off of a rubric from the Encyclopedia of Political Thought. Okay. Right now it's um, between 78 and 85% accurate on defining whether something is hateful or non-hateful. And I think that's really interesting because there's an 80% agreement baseline between people. Right. So when you say accurate, uh, that does, uh, you know, um, one person's hate speech is, mm -hmm. is often not another person's hate speech, right? They think mm -hmm. it's... Uh, that's why the baseline yeah. was so surprising. Okay, right. Because if 80% of people are in agreement, maybe that's, that, maybe that's something that we, we want to think about. Maybe there are commonalities. And that's what AI can be used for, for pulling out these characteristics that help us understand the phenomenon better, not really for telling us what it is or is not. And the importance of this project was to try to regain the perspective of targeted groups. So this is creating community-centric definitions of what hate speech looks like. And we can use that as a tool to take to tech companies and say, don't tell us what hate speech is or is not, but listen to what the targets are telling you that it is and be responsive to user concerns. So David, um, uh, Hassan mentioned earlier the, the worry about government access to all the private information that the tech companies have about us. Um, you were, of course, uh, working in, at the Department of Justice. Uh, you have some experience in, uh, in seeking orders, uh, seeking warrants, et cetera, uh, compelling the disclosure of information, which can ob obviously be critical to solving any, any uh, issue, uh, any crime, et cetera. Um, but we've seen this blow up in the, in the Apple v. FBI case a couple years ago, right? We saw a huge amount of concern from the public. The FBI thought that it was an open and shut case. Everyone's going to be sympathetic with the FBI. This is a, anti -ter this is a case of terrorism. Um, where, um, but it turned out that people were sympathetic with Apple because everyone has smartphones. Uh, and so they didn't want uh, Apple to be writing new code to to undermine smartphone security. Um, what's your take on um, government access to data held by private companies? What are the appropriate limits? Um, and uh, you know, uh, maybe you can even talk about Carpenter in the process. There's, it's a big open question. Yeah, so it's a, it is certainly a big question. And I, so I, think, I think Hassan is right to, to say that the kinds of information that government uh, has the ability to request from companies is changing very quickly. Um, but these are not also, these also are not brand new questions. That is to say, the precedents that were cited in the Apple litigation in San Bernardino were 20 or 30 or 40 years old. And, and the statute th that was used was 200 years statu old. The statute uses 200. No, that's exactly right. Uh, and it's funny because one, you know, one of the 
one of the arguments that was made uh, uh, against the government was, how can you use a statute that was written in the 1790s to justify uh, you know, cracking a smartphone? But by the same token, uh, we were using the Fourth Amendment, uh, which is unarguably applies to smartphones, and nobody would argue that it doesn't. Certainly the government wouldn't have argued that uh, and didn't. Uh, so we're using old rules by analogy, as has been said before. Um, and, and so, for example, in the, in the, in the San Bernardino case, there were, there were arguments as to um, whether this was similar to uh, compelling uh, telephone companies to provide access to dial digits in the 80s, and whether the statute that was used to accomplish that result in the 80s would, would also apply here. So I think this question is both about um, the degree of conscription involved, that is to say, are you asking a company for something that's already produced for its own business purposes and it has sitting on a shelf somewhere? Are you asking it to run an automated process that it runs routinely, but it hasn't run yet? Are you asking it to develop something new that it has the expertise and ability to do based on its product line, but has not yet created? And you can argue different fact patterns uh, along, that, uh, along that spectrum. Then there's a separate question of what should the government have to show to, to get that piece of information? And you could say, well, something very minimal if it's a business record, perhaps just a subpoena or something much more burdensome with a higher degree of showing of need if it's something more private. And that brings us to the Carpenter case a little bit. The Carpenter case, as I'm sure everybody here, uh, certainly everyone has a cell phone, uh, knows, um, is the Supreme Court case where the, the police um, were using a court order requested cell site location information uh, from, the tel from two different telephone companies in an attempt to solve uh, a, a series of armed robberies and sought records of a suspect to determine if the suspect's phone was located near the robberies at the time of the robberies. And the cell phone companies in these cases both stored that record for different periods of time, but up to months, um, um, and were able to gather it, um, having collected it for their own purposes, and were able to provide it to the government. And Carpenter alleged that requires a warrant um, because it's constitutionally protected, that it constitutes a search for the government to get that business record information. Um, so, in my view, so this is surprising that the case hasn't been decided yet. I think a lot of people expect it to come out earlier in the term. I presume we'll see it next week. Um, and per perhaps that indicates that the justices are having a little bit of difficulty getting on one page. In, in my view, having, having, you know, having prosecuted numerous cases where we relied on cell site location information to establish, uh, to establish guilt, and also where we used it to rule out suspects who, who we learned were not involved in cases, this case is not that important for cell site location information. And the reason is because there's already a statute that Congress enacted many years ago which provides the, that the government already needs to make a showing to a judge, and they already need to show facts suggesting that the information will be relevant to the investigation. And the difference between the statutory standard and the constitutional standard in this case is not that high, and it would not make much of a difference for privacy or for law enforcement, I think, no matter how it comes out. But there are potentially much broader implications with respect to how the court treats information gathered by private sector companies about their customers. Um, and so he, here too for, and the argument the government relies on is, this is information in the hands of a third party, it's not private. You turn on your phone, you knew that, or you should have known that it was communicating with cell towers, and so we're just getting business records. This is no different than getting your billing records with a subpoena as far as the Constitution is concerned. Um, whereas on the other side, um, Carpenter himself made the argument and, and had various amici supporting him saying, no, no, location information is extremely private it tells you a lot about a person, maybe even more than the content of their calls in some cases, and so it ought to be, it ought to require a warrant. So how the court teases through that will be very difficult. It's not an easy line to draw to say this kind of information in the hand of a third party is really private and this kind is not. If the government wants to speak to your neighbor or your best friend or your parents, they can do so with a mere subpoena and require them to go to the grand jury and reveal your innermost secrets. Um, Whereas to get cell site location information arguably is much less private because it shows in the Carpenter case it was uh, an area that was many city blocks wide and showed that someone was an area where there were tens of thousands of people and, and hundreds and hundreds of businesses. Didn't reveal that much at all. So it's going to be very interesting to see how the court tries to, to, to articulate what makes location information different, what makes cell site location from diff different from location information you can infer from a credit card record, which indicates exactly where you were and exactly what you were buying at that time, but requires much less judicial process. So, um, you know, I, I find Carpenter to be one of the most fascinating cases in a long time, right? And I think 
um, what it does is exactly what David described, right? It takes out the old rules that we've been applying for centuries, if not decades, right? And applies it in our modern context. And if we look at, you know, one of the things that David said is old rules by analogy, but it's so difficult now to apply those old rules. And exactly what we're dealing with here, and I think, you know, I had the opportunity to read the transcript on the plane ride over, and what you see is that, and I urge all of you to kind of, to the extent that you guys are nerds on this issue, to read through the transcript before the opinion comes out, because what I saw, at least, and David, correct me if you, if you saw, you know, if I'm wrong or if you saw something different, but I saw the I'm gonna court ask, really... I'm going to ask Britain's algorithm to tell you. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably even more accurate than what I'm going to say. Um, but what I saw is the court really struggling with this concept, right? I mean, one of the things that was brought up uh, during oral, oral argument is whether or not the kind of the, um, the distinction that we make between content and non-content is, is appropriate in our day and age, whether or not the content bucket is somehow under-inclusive. So if you look at just location data for a second, right? You know, one person's location at one given time, you know, we can argue whether that's a business record, whether it's actually really privacy intrusive, right? You know, um, doesn't seem like it's that privacy intrusive, but 127 days worth is a lot. And mm -hmm. during oral argument, what you saw is the justice saying, well, where's the line? And actually, neither side wanted to say that, like, to tell the court where to draw the line. They said, well, you should do it at 24 hours, or maybe you could do it more, or maybe you could do it less, and the lower courts will figure it out. But that's not really how we have to deal with what's going on in our modern age, right? We are not only talking about location information, but we're talking about a whole set of new data, um, kind of uh, a number of new data sets that are potentially available, that potentially we're kind of accumulating on a daily basis, whether it's health records, um, uh, certainly our like search history, um, they don't neatly fall within content, non-content, right? And I think that's part of what I think you'll see the justices struggle with in their opinion. Um, and then there's a layer on top of that, the third party doctrine, right? Which is, well, you lose all of those protections if you hand it over to a third, comp uh, third party company, but everything we do involves a third party company now, right? Like that's the way the modern economy is supposed to work. Um, so how do we reconcile those concepts together? Um, I have no idea how the Supreme Court's gonna come out, but I'm super interested to see whenever it does happen. And I actually think it'll probably be one of the last opinions because I think they're really struggling with this. Yeah, and one thing that adds, I think the court, so when I say this, this is not a new problem, and the court's been fudging this problem for yeah. 100 years already, yeah. that is to say, exactly. mm -hmm. if you go to a hotel room, you have an expectation of privacy, even though there are third parties in and out of that room all the time. Right. If you yeah. send a letter through the mail, you're giving it to a third party, yeah. but it gets Fourth Amendment protection. So uh, it's not the case, I think, that there's ever been a third party doctrine uh, in, a, in a pure sense. Right. It's a question of what exceptions has the court been willing to recognize and say, this is exceedingly private and maybe a little creepy, and therefore we want to give it enhanced protection. Yeah. I, I feel like we're entering what I like to call the awkward adolescence of the internet, <laughs> where um, th these sort of arguments um, about applying modern problems to older statutes I think has, has been really salient when you look at the cyber harassment related sphere for a while, especially because that those battles are fought, fought mostly on the state level. And some of the earlier problems were, were really stark, like with cyber harassment statutes that took physical harassment statutes and just added the word cyber or computer to them without realizing that that would mandate in-person contact to actually be applicable in any sort of meaningful way. So, by the way, Google, I think, is old enough to drink, um, and Facebook <laughs> is not yet old enough to drink, but it may be able to vote, right? But they're both uh, awkward. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but, um, um, and Twitter is not uh, either, all right? I think it's uh, still a gangly teenager. Um, but yet it is drinking, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Reddit. <laughs> I think that's... <laughs> um, so... Um, Cyber harassment is, uh, is uh, obviously a very significant issue. There have been a number of statutes that have been passed across the country. Uh, as I understand, 40 uh, revenge porn statutes in particular that have just been uh, enacted. Um, but there ha they have faced some challenges from you know, the ACLU uh, in, uh, in Arizona. Uh, there was a challenge to a statute. Um, and uh, so uh, on First Amendment grounds, um, is it possible to have a, a, a statute that you know is targeted specifically at the horrible harms of revenge porn um, that are uh, that are consistent with the First Amendment? Uh, either of you, anyone? Well, 
so I think I think revenge porn, uh, to the extent that those statutes are narrowly targeted at revenge porn, they run a, a greater possibility of running the First Amendment gauntlet and being held to be constitutional. I mean, ironically, some of the most successful ways of a, of getting at revenge porn have focused on copyright law because, of course, intellectual property is balanced against free speech and free expression differently than something that you might call hate speech. Uh, I've written about cyberbullying laws and cyber harassment laws, and usually they run into problems because, uh, especially the early ones, because they, they'd, what would, the pattern would develop like this. Something terrible would happen. Uh, this happened in um, uh, Missouri was one of the first. They had Megan's Law where a mother uh, pretended she was a teenage boy. She uh, got into a, a uh, internet relationship with this adolescent girl and then she dumped her and the young woman committed suicide shortly thereafter and explicitly saying it was because this, this fake boy that was actually the other girl's mother had, uh, had essentially tipped her into it. And so uh, some of the first laws were passed in light of very horrific circumstances. But the problem is sometimes good intentions don't make for constitutional laws. And the, the biggest problem those had, as you said, they were patterned on physical harassment laws. And a lot of them ended up being uh, vague. They ended up being overbroad, uh, both of which create you know due process and First Amendment problems. And um, and, and uh, you can see why, because the legislatures wanted to, to signal and symbolize that they would not tolerate this. But the problem is when you're going at signals and symbolism, rarely are you crafting the kind of narrow laws that the First Amendment actually demands. It, it demands that you get into narrow categories of unprotected speech and target those. And a lot of those early cyberbullying and cyber harassment laws simply didn't do that. So I want to uh, return to something you said, uh, Dean Linsky, about uh, the right to be forgotten um, and its uh, kind of uh, um, implementation globally, right? Some of the early um, kind of uh, rulings coming out of Europe uh, insist that this right be not just uh, confined to uh, de-indexing for the uh, so that to prevent the viewing within Europe, but also to go uh, de-index it globally. Uh, though there have been different rulings now within Europe on this question. Uh, what about the, uh, the right to be forgotten and its kind of globalization? Does anyone else, would, uh, would, you, would anyone else like to speak to that? Can we, should we, with, is the right to be forgotten enforceable in the United States? So I'll, I'll start. I think other folks should contribute as well. I think so. This is you know this is an issue that's come to the forefront as as obviously American internet companies are doing business really globally, um, and are and are um, finding themselves subject to court orders in foreign countries that that like many American court orders have done for a long time are purporting to require conduct to take place abroad. Um, and so there's there's you know the Google has found itself in France being ordered to do a global takedown notice. That's that's you know. Up, um, up in the European Court of Justice as we speak. Um, and, and Google also in Canada had a similar case uh, that came up just in the last year where they were ordered by a Canadian court to de-link uh, to a company that was allegedly infringing on intellectual uh, privacy, uh, intellectual property rights of, um, of the plaintiff. And the, the Canadian Supreme Court ordered Google to de-link globally. Google then went to court in San Francisco and, and got an order saying, enforcement of the Canadian order would violate American law un under the CDA that we've talked about already, and then took that American court order back to Canada to say, see, this conflicts with American law, you should modify the Canadian judgment. And the Canadian court took a look at it and said, we see why this is not enforceable in America, but we're not trying to enforce it in America. We have our own system right here. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in this opinion that says it would be a violation of American law for Google to delink. It just says that we can't make you do it in American court. And so you still have to go do it. So, so you, know, you see these uh, these areas where there's you know there's sometimes there's conflicts of laws that are created, and sometimes there's not. There's court there's companies that are put in a decision of do we want to comply with a particular foreign law uh, if it would have effects in the United States, which links very closely to the debate that that we touched upon earlier, uh, you know, certainly in the introduction about the Cloud Act and the Microsoft case, which was which was recently moved to the Supreme Court. So I'll happy to turn it over to Hassan if he wants to. Yeah, so I think um, 
the cloud act is a little different than kind of the right to be forgotten, but it implicates certainly the same issues, right? Which is the kind of the, the growing international um, concern and need for access to evidence across borders and conflicting law. So um, as David mentioned, the cloud act gives a little background on the Microsoft case. So um, in the Microsoft case, we had a case before the Supreme Court um, this term where um, the government sought to compel Microsoft to produce data that was stored overseas. Um, and you know, our, uh, the Microsoft argument um, was that the statute doesn't allow that. The statute um, was written in 1986 and it was, did not have clearly extraterritorial reach. Um, so it was basically a, a, a case about statutory construction. Um, but ultimately, the, the issue at the heart of the, uh, of the Microsoft case was conflicting law, right? So we have uh, simultaneously, not just in the US, but all across the world, we have law enforcement seeking to assert authority extraterritorially, while at the same time erecting um, privacy statutes or blocking statutes seeking to protect their citizens' information for entirely valid reasons. But when you take that structure and you replicate it across <laughs> you know, the dozens and dozens of countries, and then you overlay on top of that multinational and global um, uh, tech companies, you have a huge problem, right? So in that case, um, complying with US warrant um, would potentially conflict with Irish law. Um, and that was actually the, 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 what we were trying to highlight in the case itself, right? We were trying to bring governments together to negotiate this growing problem and find a solution. And that's ultimately what the Clown Act does, right? Um, and I think you know we had a conversation a little earlier about whether or not the Clown Act is a solution to the problem. And I think the answer there is a little bit of yes and a little bit of no. So certainly it resolves the legal question presented in the Microsoft case, which is it amends US law to make clear that US authorities have extraterritorial reach. And it also clarifies you know, uh, protections for providers to protect our own customers, giving us further opportunity to seek judicial review when there's a conflict of law um, and some notice rights as well. But the real promise of the Cloud Act is that it creates a concrete framework for international agreements. It essentially allows for governments to talk to each other to resolve this problem, right? Like we are, Microsoft is not a government, right? We can't negotiate these agreements. We can't do away with law um, that conflicts. Um, and you know what the Cloud Act does is it um, enables the U.S. government to enter into agreements with other countries, the U.K. being one that's on the table right now, and certainly more to follow. That allows for um, you know cross-border access to evidence, right? But it also allows countries to agree on a set of terms and privacy protections that, protect, that apply to their own citizens and data stored in those countries. Um, but one thing that you know I love about the Cloud Act is it also elevates global norms on government access, right? The requirements in the Cloud Act enable the US government to enter into these bilateral agreements when there's sufficient rule of law protections, when there's judicial oversight or review, right? When there's proper transparency. And we, you know, as, as a large multinational and kind of um, global company, we constantly face pressure from foreign governments across the world on government access to data. And what we're able to do now, and I think what we're able to clearly point to you, is a set of global norms that countries should follow and should um, amend their law to kind of to meet those expectations and that way we get sufficient protections all across the board even if it's not completely analogous to probable cause right so uh, so this this concept of kind of a forced harmonization of laws around global norms I think is is really powerful and that can be a positive force when we're talking about things like due process and elevating the global norms to American standards. But in the First Amendment sphere, there's a phenomenon known as American exceptionalism. And that's, in the US, we balance individual autonomy, dignity, privacy versus free speech, uh, freedom of expression differently than a lot of the rest of the world. We balance it differently than Europe. We, we balance it differently uh, than they do in the UK. And so, is this harmonization of global norms because of the presence of these, these multinational, multi-jurisdictional big tech companies going to result in a reduction of American free speech values under the First Amendment? And I'll give you an example of, of a case that illustrates how the right to be forgotten really is somewhat antithetical to American values. So there's a case called Martin B. Hearst out of the Sixth Circuit and Martin B. Hearst uh, dealt with someone who wanted it taken off the internet uh, by a newspaper that she had had a criminal conviction because the conviction was later expunged. 
And so she bas it basically was a right to be forgotten case. And the court said no, even though it was expunged, and expungement is supposed to mean it's as if it never happened, you can't erase the public record once it's out there. You can't tell a newspaper to forget what's happened historically, and even the passage of time really, really doesn't make a difference. And that's completely antithetical to the Google Spain doctrine that ushered in uh, the, the, well, that, that decided that the right to be forgotten, they were serious about it, I guess is one way that you would say that. And so will American norms on free speech issues or the balance between free speech and privacy inevitably be pushed towards the global norms, you know, by just the, the, the relationships between the government, tech companies, and individuals? David? Yes, the, one, the one point I, uh, so I, and I agree it's a very important question. And the reason I was trying to sort of um, fasten together the cloud act that I just have gotten to one debate is because I think there's two possible models, and they both exist as we speak, and they both probably will continue to coexist. But one is, you can imagine a situation where the companies themselves make a decision as to which foreign laws to follow mm -hmm. and to respect. And, and they do so in part on the basis of what their customers expect and demand of them. So I'm Microsoft, and I'm storing data abroad. Am I going to turn over the content uh, to a foreign government? Right? If, so, if I get an order, a request from the Chinese for government that relates to potential infringement to an American citizen, am I going to turn that over? Microsoft has one way of handling that based on where it stores the information. Other providers have other ways, and they have to make decisions at some point. Are they going to comply with, for example, Chinese search warrants for content relating to non-Chinese individuals? And if they do, they might see flight of customers, and that might answer the question for them. Another way is for the companies to say, we don't really want to be in a position to make this decision. These are more governmental decisions. These are values decisions that are really bigger than us. And the Cloud Act, to me, instantiates part of that. So the Cloud Act has two parts, as Hassan mentioned. One is um, how, you know, governing when the US government can ask for data. And the second is creating this framework for agreements. And if a country has an agreement with the US, if they get into that, that group of folks with that agreement, then they're allowed to serve orders for data stored in the United States, as long as it doesn't belong to an American citizen or someone located in the United States. Um, but the companies don't decide who gets into that group. That's a decision for the executive branch with participation by Congress. Because that's a very fraught question. Is your, are your country's laws good enough? Are your civil rights protections adequate such that we're going to allow you to access data that we store in the United States? And there are a lot of good reasons, it seems to me, why a company shouldn't be making that decision. And, and it makes sense to me why the, all of the major providers supported a statute which takes that decision away from them, in a sense. And you could see a similar framework extending to the First Amendment, mm -hmm. right, to be forgotten, context as well. But I think there's always going to be a bit of both of those, and it's always mm -hmm. going to be an interesting question as to what kinds of decisions the companies want to make yeah. and which kinds they would rather have governments make. Yeah. No, I, I, think, I think that's, that's right. And I think the, the one thing that I would add is that the, the decision ultimately still isn't, is with the companies, right? And I think there's, there's a part of um, part of a company action here on where you decide to do business and how you structure your services, right? So certainly in more problematic areas of the world, um, we, we look very closely at our GNI principles and our human rights principles, and those are elevated right up to um, the senior leadership team. And those decisions are not just you know, whether or not to comply with a specific law, but whether or not to even do business in a jurisdiction at all, given the fact that there may be human rights concerns going forward. And certainly within the Cloud Act, um, you're absolutely right that it defers part of the decision-making authority, right, on who is and who is not, you know, um, globally acceptable in, in part of the crowd, um, and a large part of the forcing functionaries for Congress to, to hopefully play a little bit of an intermediary there and hold people's feet to the fire. But at the same time, the Cloud Act doesn't make compliance with that legal process mandatory, right? Mm -hmm. That it is still a voluntary issue on whether or not uh, companies have, you know, it, if you actually wanted to fight a Cloud Act type of order, you would have to go and look and see whether or not comp a country X has jurisdiction over, um, over Microsoft or any of the other providers. So there is a still a little bit of a voluntariness built into the process, but you're right that part of the, the calculus was um, to have other folks also participate in the conversation of who is and who is not um, privacy and rights protective in a way that protects our global customers. So, um, so uh, in about five, ten minutes, I'm going to turn it over to you guys, so just be uh, prepared with your questions. Uh, so, in 2016, we saw extensive uh, meddling by 
uh, Russia in U.S. elections. We have another uh, set of elections coming up uh, this fall, uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, more uh, elections to come. And it doesn't seem that we are doing enough to prepare uh, as a government. Um, and I'm just wondering, what do you know? What do companies like Microsoft, uh, or if uh, if David wants to talk about what what, what should the government be doing? Uh, to respond to this kind of menace. Um, what responsibilities do these companies have? What, what can, uh, so in this, in the 2016 case, we saw um, online platforms being abused by uh, bots and, uh, and troll farms, et cetera, uh, to promote uh, uh, particular causes uh, in the United States. Um, what should we be doing now to prevent this menace to democracy? So. I guess I can start. Um, I think certainly there's a little bit of um, responsibility on that companies feel to engage in this effort. And at Microsoft, we recently launched the Defending Democracy Project, um, which focuses not just on disinformation, but also more on building the capacity of democratic institutions for kind of cyber resilience, for cybersecurity, for um, greater transparency in political ads. And that's really where we see we can be a value add, right? And I think, you know, Britton was talking a little bit earlier about how to define um, hate speech and you know disinformation and all those campaigns and in, in that sphere we're partnering with other organizations because it's not easy to tell um, to say what is good and what is bad speech certainly when it's political um, but where we've jumped into the fray is to um, to hopefully provide uh, cybersecurity and other type of tools for governments to ensure that the electoral process itself is not corrupted um, so that's one thing that we're doing and I think you know part of um, part of the conversation certainly should focus on disinformation, which has been a large part of what we've been talking about all along, and certainly a large part of what's in the media. But it should also focus on how do we protect this stuff from happening going forward? How do we protect hacks? How do we protect kind of voting machines and everything else? I think another part of, of this that's very essential is um, allowing the public to know how misinformation and disinformation actually works. Because I think there's a lot of um, misinformation about misinformation. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually very akin to how troll storm works and how individuals are targeted online. When you look at troll storms, they exploit the architecture of the internet to drown out legitimate speech and dissent. And when you look at the way that um, things happened in 2016, if you look at it from a technical aspect, um, we. The point of misinformation and, and disinformation is not to get you to believe what is true to be false. It is to have, it's to move the needle a little bit. It's to have you doubt that anything is true at all. So it's, and that's a very different mechanism than trying to convince you that, you know, that the sky is red. Um, there's a couple techniques that we, we saw used a lot. Uh, one is sea lioning. They, these all have really evocative names. So I, I, I love the names. Sea lioning is when somebody, or, or a bot, but when a, um, a party tries to engage with you and drowns you in questions. So it seems like they really want to legitimately talk about things, but they overwhelm you to the point where you can't respond. And then the reply of that party is, well, I, I was reasonable. I was trying to engage with you. You're actually the one who's shutting down communication. So a lot of these techniques assume a functional marketplace of ideas. They assume that um, more speech is still an adequate response. And um, what 2016 has, has led some civil rights groups to question is, does that paradigm still exist? There's astroturfing, where it's generating a lot of automated responses to make people think there is more grassroots support for certain viewpoints than there actually is, astroturfing. Mm -hmm. Um, there's dogpiling, which is using abusive content to silence groups or individuals from participating in civic engagement. The, the most interesting thing to me is if you look at how this is done technically, at least in the, the electoral context, it's designed to make us hate each other. It is, misinformation and disinformation is designed to amplify social cleavages. So there was a study about um, the social mapping related to Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter slash Blue Lives Matter. Depending on which hashtag you followed on Twitter, you saw a completely different version of the debate. Mm -hmm. And they didn't touch at all. 
what researchers then did was they're like, well, you know, Twitter released all these Russian affiliated accounts. Let's see, let's see how that maps on top of this. And so it looks like the eyes of Dr. Eckelberg, where it's these two completely separate round debates and the most virulent, adamant, and aggressive people in the middle at the heart of each debate were Russian affiliated. And so they were egging each other on and trying to amplify the disagreements that already existed in civil society. This is also how misinformation and disinformation works by um, exploiting the architecture of the internet to create a false perception of what um, the status quo looks like. So that's fascinating. That suggests that um, some of the stuff you might say might be true, um, the trolls might say might be true, but that the misinformation aspect of it is that it's seeming, it's pretending to be um, a actual partisan in the debates, mm -hmm. uh, pr pretending to be authentic. So the misinformation is actually not in the content of what's communicated, other than in the connotations and context in which yeah. it's communicated. The, the biggest mistake that people make about <laughs> misinformation and disinformation is assuming that it's obvious and assuming that the people who create this and spread it throughout yeah. our society are dumb. They're, they're, they're sophisticated to the point where it doesn't matter how educated you are, it plays off people's vanities and off people's pre-existing biases. So uh, at least in, in our research, we have seen the same ads being sent to people on the far political right and the far political left with just different texts. And on one side, it is white supremacy, and on the other side, it is anti-globalization. It's the same ad, just a few words changed. And if you look at this stuff, it's very persuasive because it says you are a you are a savvy consumer of media, and we are just going to tell we're just going to give you the facts. You decide for yourself. The way misinformation and disinformation works is I, I like to say it's not it's more like a rainstorm than a raindrop. So a a raindrop if it hits you you brush it off it doesn't really modify your behavior, but a what a rainstorm does is it makes you take cover or open an umbrella. It pr it primes you for action. And so that is actually the point of misinformation and disinformation to encourage the populace to take politically oriented actions that they, um, if exposed to one or two instances, they probably wouldn't take. You know, what's interesting to me about this is these are, these are intentional manipulations with technological tools, but even technological tools can distort what we believe uh, to be the truth even when it's not uh, motivated by ill purposes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Facebook, there was a controversy during the election about trending topics being uh, too anti-conservative. And so they replaced human editors in an attempt to de-bias and, and prevent discrimination against conservative viewpoints with an algorithm that seems like a good thing, right? We'll eliminate the bias because we'll let the computer decide what people really like, what they share, what they, what they want, right? So it, it's aggregated preferences. And they, truthfully, they were aggregated preferences, but it turns out that fake news <coughs> spreads more rapidly and more easily than real news because it, it fits into people's cognitive biases, it fits into their pre-existing narratives, it has emotion attached to it. And so trying to cure the biases with an algorithm ended up creating its own set of preferences, even when it was well-intentioned. Yeah, I, I like to say computational propaganda is the preferred term. <laughs> yeah. Because it's not a new phenomenon, but it's a new delivery mechanism and, and a new, um, sort of a new seeding mechanism. So when I talk about computational propaganda, people understand a little better what's at, what's at the heart of it. But don't you think the technology makes us, it makes it seem objective? I mean, the mere fact that a technology has delivered this to us, it makes it seem objective in a way that makes it more insidious than... I, I'd agree with that. Uh, there's a researcher that I know who, who studies computational propaganda, online things, and she says that she can really only look at it for half hour, hour at a time because it makes her start to doubt. She says that it's so persuasive. Um, and again, just designed to move you one step to, one step in other direction. So uh, she was doing research on the, the Syrian white helmets 
and how that group was being targeted by misinformation and disinformation campaigns. And, and even she was saying that she started to question. And she, and she studies how this works. So it's, 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 I think you're right that it's very insidious and very subtle. Great. So we have time for questions from you. Um, so if you just please come up to the microphone, that would be terrific. My name is Keith West. Uh, I have a question that um, is in my head, and if it, I'll try to get it to come out succinctly. But uh, it, it seems obvious that you're going to need to have really radical solutions to these problems at some point. I mean, with the, uh, the bot thing, for example, that, that seems to have affected the election, I mean, that, if that issue continues, it, it seems like it had these very far-reaching effects. Um, with Privacy on the internet, for example, it's now commonplace for people to share more information through their Google searches and whatnot than uh, people ever shared with their journals back when that would have been something that um, you know, the government other entities couldn't have access to. And so it, it seems like we're in this weird time. It reminds me actually of at the turn of the century um, where the economy, it, it seems in, in society, Generally speaking, there was consensus the economy was broken because of the monopolies. You had you know, a monopoly in oil, a monopoly in steel, so on. And so the general consensus in society that the economy couldn't continue that way and you had to have these radical solutions where they, they busted the trust. Um, what I just don't seem to hear anywhere, though, uh, and I don't know if may, maybe the radical solutions aren't required or, or maybe you have suggestions, but... Um, Ultimately, maybe in the next few years, what sort of things can be done to, you know, aggressively address, for example, foreign interference in the elections or the possibility that people are just going to fundamentally lose the concept of privacy that we, uh, we've come to expect. Thank you. Um, takers for that, uh, well, that bleak uh, it, question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll pick it up. You know, I, I will say, you know, I, I prosecuted terrorism cases for a decade, and Britain just scared the crap out of me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm fun at dinner parties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I, I'm a little more optimistic than that in the sense that I do think these are sort of you know, intense new problems that we have to figure out how to deal with, but I don't think any of them are unsolvable. And I think when, you know, you know, my general viewpoint when it comes to things like misinformation and fake news is, they can be really effective, you know, once or maybe twice. But I, you know, Americans are very sophisticated, and they're constantly getting more sophisticated and finding ways to discern the differences between what's real and what's fake. And I think, I think the reason, uh, you know, I, I think you can spring something on an unsuspecting public, but I do think that people learn from it. And so, not to discount at all the risks that have been identified or the impact that they may or may not have had. I do think it's hard for them to continue to be successful, and people do develop an immunity and a sophistication about these things. Um, and that has been a fundamental premise of American law and society for a couple of hundred years now, throughout a lot of different revolutions in, in science and technology. So I guess I'm not despairing to that same level, you know, without discounting that there's a lot of, um, there can be a lot of impact along the way. One of the things that I think would, would be something that we can uh, do now, and that um, I think has increased salience with other current events is to uh, support the role of institutions like the press in our society. Um, the, I, I just got back from Estonia and there they have an extraordinarily resilient population since they were um, occupied by, by Russia and for 40 years um, dealt with all of this and they kind of laugh and say, oh, naive Americans, don't you know you don't trust anything written? But as long, I, I think if we support the role of a free and open press that is able to ask and answer questions, that will, that will have a, a big part. Um, the, the challenge that I saw with the 2016 election is if you look at, at how media theorists were um, mapping it out, you saw the emergence of this alternative press universe that was unintentionally feeding into this misinformation and disinformation. But it's not as bleak as you think. So uh, Columbia Journalism Review did this study and they saw that 80% of people, 
regardless of where they were on the political spectrum, to the far left, to about the center right, were getting their news from the same sources. They were all citing the same sources on Twitter. They were looking at it, and they didn't agree with the content, and they would debate about it fiercely, but they agreed that this was the body of legitimate professionalized news. It was this 20% that emerged in about mid-2015, and it created the, these stars of self-reinforcing um, articles. A would cite B, B would cite C, C would cite D, D would cite E. And so people f who, who used those sources of information, which were, that's the Breitbart universe, um, they thought that they were getting legitimate news. They, they honestly believed that they were um, looking at various, various sources. They were hearing this everywhere because it was all everywhere that they looked. And it created this false um, epistemolo epistemology of of news. So protecting the institutions that are designed to give us news even when we don't agree with them, but are institutionalized and professional, that I think is the one thing that we can do to keep this from happening again. Larissa. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I have lots of thoughts on, on fake news. I, you know, I, I'm a media law professor, but, uh, but uh, one of the alarming things when we think about um, kind of the narrative right now is we have important institutions in society being undermined. Uh, the, the media, the legitimacy of the media, uh, you can argue about whether it was already vulnerable, but, and, you know, the president has exploited that vulnerability to attack the legitimacy of the traditional press as an institution. Uh, attacking the rule of law is, you're right, institutional support for basing public policy on factual data and truth mm -hmm. is incredibly important. Civic education, teaching people to be sophisticated consumers of information is more important today than it's ever been. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's been talk about should the government have a role in regulating to ensure that the truth emerges uh, in this polarized debate. This, I, I, I agree with... Uh, with someone here in the front row who is, <laughs> is shaking her head rather vigorously. I mean, the, the problem is, you know, you, you do want to weed out the uh, fake news, but at what cost? At the cost of turning the government loose to decide what the fake news is and what's not. But I really have hope in this harmonization around global norms in part. So the, um, the GDPR, which stands for General Data Pre Protection Regulation. The General Data Protection Regulation, which went into effect May 25th, um, it has in it the right to be forgotten, but it has a lot of other uh, aspects to it too that might be helpful in um, preventing pollution of the information stream, weeding out pollution of the information stream, protecting privacy. So it has a right of access to the information that's being corrected about you. Uh, a right to correct errors in that information, including the right to be forgotten, which is the most problem, you know, that's a problematic aspect uh, in the American system. But things like requiring companies to tell you what they're gonna do with your information and to discard it once it's no longer being used for those purposes, there's nothing in the First Amendment that ought to interfere with that in particular. Um, so there's, there's, like the, the forces are changing. Forces don't just, you know, I've been in law a long time and it's, it's very interesting when you do this for a long time to, to watch social norms change over time even when the constitutional rules are the same and to see how that really fundamentally affects the exercise of rights. So, you know, I have, I have some hope going forward that we, we will move in a, in a good direction. Can I just um, asterisk the one point about fake news? Um, the, the term is largely been introduced by our president, right? Uh, so um, he's setting the terms of our discourse, what we are, you know, grappling with, um, and uh, and it's been used largely to attack uh, what he thinks is critical news of him, which is largely true, right? So, so computational so, propaganda. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So right. it's very so the it's part of what what Britain has been talking about, which is trying to get us to distrust everything, right? Uh, and so when the, the real news comes, which is very antithetical to our president's uh, preferences, uh, we are supposed then to 
treat it as fake. Uh, and so by, by, by uh, undermining all these things. At the same time, I want to just say that I think our news media d deserves a lot of criticism. Mm -hmm. I am not a huge, uh, I think we need, uh, uh, so I'm a huge defender of, of our media, but I also am a huge critic of our media, and I think we need both at the same time. Uh, you know, the New York Times, uh, you know, the Silicon Valley companies disclose, uh, you know, uh, diversity statistics, uh, the New York Times does not. Uh, and so, you know, there are a lot of things that we could ask, uh, you know, I think it has, if you look at its editorial page, you know, for decades, it's had, I think, a quota of one uh, non-white person on its editorial page. So I think there's reasons to be uh, to be concerned about uh, our, our traditional media. So I'm a huge defender for our traditional media, but I'm glad that we have, at least some of us have new media to criticize the old media at the same time. I do think we should understand a little more how the new media works, though. Yeah. This is a little um, personal, but um, a the main white supremacist website uh, dis heard about the AI work that my center has been doing and decided that we were censoring the internet. And so they directed people to send um, YouTube videos to, to, to me personally to tell me how they felt. Um, those were fun. Uh, from there it went to Breitbart and it was on the front page of Breitbart for two days. From there it was picked up by Pamela Geller, from there it was picked up by Glenn Beck, and from there it was picked up by some right-leaning um, right mainstream news within five days. And so what started off uh, in like neo-Nazi chat rooms ends up on the news with very little, very little acknowledgement that right. this, that's what that is, and this, mm. it's not actually a news story. No, that's a great, great point. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, um, Ms. Heller, I feel your pain. I um, <laughs> was listed on Breitbart as somebody, Breitbart did this, I don't even call it an article, this is not my question by the way, but I don't even want to call it an article <laughs> because it literally, like they said, these people used to work for the Obama administration or Hillary Clinton, and they now work at Facebook. And it just listed people, and it went to our LinkedIn profiles and just attached our name and had our position now at Facebook and our former positions in the Obama administration. And that was it. That was You're the here. article. And thankfully, I didn't get any hate mail or anything like that, but I, I, I feel your pain. So my question, actually, and I think it, it, it's sort of directed to you, though not, though not exclusively. Um, so again, I work at Facebook. Um, we have. 2.2 billion users across the world, 85, 87%, I believe, are outside of the United States. Most of the discussion here has focused mostly on the United States, which is appropriate, American Constitution Society, we're in the United States. But we um, have to deal with a number of countries that have passed laws that sort of restrict some of what we can do. For example, there's one country that gives individuals a private right of action against social media companies that take down their information. And so sometimes when we would take down information that we see as hate speech, people threaten to sue or do sue us for taking down information that we view as hate speech. Another country um, has passed a law basically requiring us to leave up hate organizations. We take down hate organizations, and this country has a number of, of um, I would call them probably white supremacists, but hate organizations that spew all sorts of, 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 of hate. Um, and basically saying, if you take down these groups, if you don't allow them a presence on your platform, we are gonna hold you liable. So I'm just wondering how, and, and again, thinking about like, not just Facebook, but all these social media companies are global companies that are trying to navigate these different laws around the world. And in our fight against hate organizations and, and hate speech specifically, how do we deal with, with, with that other, the other side that where, where it's sort of like a hyper First Amendment, right? Like, you can't take down anything. But we want to be able, we want our platforms to be a safe place for people. So what are your, some of your maybe suggestions for how to deal with those kinds of issues? Thank you. That's a really good question. And if I had the answer, I'd probably be working for Facebook. <laughs> but the, the, the one thing that I've seen across all social media, and, and um, not just Facebook, is what, what moves the needle in regard, for, uh, in regard to online harassment or hate speech or other types of activity that target vulnerable populations is um, it's the social environment created within the online space and not so much the trappings that we associate more with American values. And the, an example of that is um, the debate about anonymous speech. If you look at how anonymous speech functions in, related, in relation to cyber harassment, it actually doesn't have the, 
the impact that people thought it would. People say it's common sense. If people are anonymous, then they're going to harass people more. When you look at the research, that's not how it works because online environments have consequences. You have a reputational status within these online platforms, even if your name is Fluffy Bunny 22. So it was creating mechanisms within these spaces where people felt like they were, one, going to get social censure from other participants in, in the group, or two, be held accountable, that made people modify their behavior. And this didn't mean that it had to be penal or even harsh, but the possibility for people to interact and say, that's not cool. I don't understand why you'd say something like that. I don't agree with you. I think what you're saying is wrong, and it makes me really uncomfortable. Those, the opportunity to have people interact in that kind of a way actually massively reduce the prevalence of the type of behaviors you're talking about. So I think allowing, encouraging people to make those views known, which um, may, may mean taking action against the bots and other mechanisms that are architecturally suppressing people from changing the social norms online. Can I just jump in from, from a legal perspective, it's interesting, so, so, so I think, I, I think Brittany's points are important, I think from a totally separate perspective from the legal one, the, the laws you're discussing are sort of the, what was missing in the Google case involving mm -hmm. Canada, the Equistec case, mm -hmm. where Google could not find a conflict of law. That is, they found they were allowed to take it down, and they went back to Canada and said, well, if this is a conflict in Canada, said, no, it's not a conflict, you can still take it down if you want to. But you could imagine a legal regime which was different, which, was, which would say, no, it is illegal to force someone to take something down, um, or is illegal, by contrast, to force them to keep something up, that, uh, to, to violate a company's freedom to enforce terms of service and create the environment it wants to create. And then you might actually have a conflict of law, which you would then be able to take back to the other country and say, look, now we have a comedy issue. Now we've an issue just like in the yeah. Cloud Act where, so in the surveillance realm, if a foreign country said, give us records from the United States, then a company could say that's illegal under American law, and whether or not we'd like to comply, we can't, so now we have to have an adult conversation about this. You could imagine a similar scenario where a foreign country is forcing a, a company, American company to not enforce terms of service that create the environment it's trying to create for its customers, and then they could then say to the foreign country, that's against American law, you can't do that. Now we have to have an adult conversation with everyone in the room. Now there, yeah. there would be a lot to work out there, and I don't yeah. pretend that that would be easy in any way, and there'd be a lot of interest on both sides, but, but you could imagine um, that world existing outside of the surveillance realm, and it would be sort of the missing ingredient in what we've seen in some of the other uh, cases going on now. Indeed. I just was thinking when Britain was speaking is that example, though, uh, you know, so the, the argument is that the marketplace of ideas is broken uh, in this environment, uh, and there are lots of good ways you can make that argument, but there's an example where counter speech, which is the ideal in the marketplace, really matters mm -hmm. uh, to create the culture. And that, there, it, you know, it's a frank recognition that there are different online cultures and the cultures re really matter. So when a legal tool is taken out of your hand, the other tools like architecture or norms become that much more important in, in addressing the problem. This goes back a little bit to what Hassan was saying about the various platforms and you know the Xbox terms of service. Um, the Xbox platform is unique, and you're going to control it in a particular way. Whereas you know uh, uh, word chat f functions, etc., are going to be totally different. Uh, and so I think that is something that is hard for people to imagine that these Silicon Valley companies all actually have very different uh, philosophies and they have very different products. Uh, that yeah, sorry, Hassan. Well, I completely agree. I think, you know, as, as we were talking about earlier, right, you, uh, the internet seems like one big monolith, as these companies do, but the services are different, and what we're mm -hmm. trying to do is different, and their purposes are different. So Xbox is a very different service than Bing or Google Search, right? Um, and Twitter is also very different than some of the more analogous services on other, on other companies. So, you know, there's always, a, there's always a balancing act of how you're trying to do this, and um, certainly going back to the question of how do you deal with kind of the legal constraints that you're operating in, as David mentioned, it is an unbelievably tricky area and it requires, um, you know, for that adult conversation to happen with the other country, you're, you're hopeful that there's an adult on the other side of the table, right? And mm -hmm. sometimes that doesn't happen um, and, uh, and there are countervailing interests, right? So when big American companies come in and say, well, First Amendment, um, that's a very foreign concept to people, and it's a very foreign concept for 
you know, for us, it seems entirely illegitimate, right? How can that be something that you don't understand? But for them, it is not something that's been baked into their society or baked into their legal regime, right? So um, coming forward with that point of view often leads to friction. Mm -hmm. And that's something that unfortunately, um, large companies by our very nature are, are trying to navigate. Um, and when we do, you know, when we, when we do have an, uh, a situation where we, where we have to say, well, company X wants this, but United States law says we can't do that, we're actually hoping the United States or somebody else says, yes, that actually is a conflict of law, right? Um, and helps us navigate those issues, which is goes full circle back to the Cloud Act, right? Which is what the Cloud Act is intended to do, is have governments talk to each other um, and have a role for companies to play as well. But that's the only way to solve that international environment. You require three parties. You require not just the companies and the foreign country, but you require the other country where whose citizens and rights are trying to be protected. The, the one thing I wish that legislators and, um, and judicial officials knew dealing with all this stuff was I, people always say, just you know, to the tech companies, put yeah. your best people on it. Yeah. And I really wish, <laughs> I really wish they knew that the best people are on it. Yeah. It's, um, they're, here, they're here on panels. They're, they're here on panels. <laughs> <laughs> they, the best people are working. The rest of us are. <laughs> I, I run a working group with um, Microsoft, Twitter, Facebook, and Google. It's an anti-cyber hate problem-solving lab, and I, I've asked them not just to bring their policy people and legal people, but also their engineers. And what is remarkable to me is how these companies have grown so fast and they're so vast that sometimes people working on different facets of the same issue within the same company don't always have clear communication or even knowledge that the other exists. So I, it's, it's very interesting to me that people assume that companies work like government bureaucracies. And I think that that's a, a misconception. And I, I just think about tiny coachmen running around all over Facebook, and it, and it gives me the, the willies. <laughs> a question. Hi. Thank you for the panel. Um, quick question. How many users does Facebook have now? Anyone? 2.2 billion? 2.2 <laughs> yeah. billion. So yeah. practically a third of humanity. And it's, I think it's unprecedented to think that a service is being used by um, a third of humanity under one company. Um, and I was wondering, you know, about like the open source kind of model, like Wikipedia, and what it might look like if um, Facebook was, was something like that, open source. I'm not a computer guy, so I don't know exactly what all that entails, but it seems to me that there would be some kind of democratic management of the service, and that that might help alleviate some of these issues. Um, with the sale of data and that sort of thing. You would need an alternative business model, and if you have one, I think Mark Zuckerberg would like to talk to you. <laughs> um, I, I also think that an interesting thing to think about with that paradigm is how Facebook is used around the world. In some places, access to Facebook is tantamount to access to the internet writ large. Right. In other places, it's not so much. So looking at the different function that Facebook plays in different societies may lead you to different implications about whether or not an open source model would be good or could have unforeseen consequences. Mm -hmm. um, I want to take a part of what you said, which is when you mentioned the 2.2 billion users, right? And I think um, certainly we're dealing with businesses here that we've probably never seen in the history of humanity, right? In terms of the power that we have, not just with the amount of people that we're able to connect, but also with the technological power that's underneath it. Um, and, you know, recently um, Brad Smith, our president of Microsoft, um, gave a talk at Code uh, maybe a week, week and a half ago talking about the responsibility of companies like Microsoft, like Facebook, and like others of actually engaging with that, right? Because, because of this newfound role, we can't shy away, and we can't shy away from some of these more public debates on how we use data, what type of transparency we have, what type of control we give our users. And we have to empower our users themselves in order to build trust in the company, right? Um, and when you have 2.2 billion users, um, that's an unbelievable statistic, um, but it also means that you have to tackle problems head on, like all the ones that we're discussing, even though the answers are not easy, right? We were joking earlier that all of these questions are so difficult, and if there were answers to any of them, the panel wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this is just something that we have to do. Um. Great. A question? 
Hi. Um, you've mentioned the Clown Act a few times. I don't know what that is. That's the first time I've ever heard it. I'm not uh, in the tech field. So can you just explain what that is, the background, a little bit more context? Thanks. Sure. Um, so it's a relatively complicated um, like piece of legislation, but what it ultimately does is it creates a framework for kind of cross-border access to evidence. So take, for example, a situation where foreign law enforcement, so um, uh, law enforcement in country X is investigating crime that locates that's located in their country that's important to country X, um, but the users that they're trying to uh, to investigate have a you know Microsoft Outlook account, right? Um, ultimately, those requests have to be sent back to Microsoft Corp in the United States. And traditionally, the process that's used for those kind of cross-border evidence requests are MLATs, right? So mutual legal assistance treaties, which are unbelievably onerous, but they were also designed in a time when we were talking about physical evidence or testimony, but certainly not for uh, digital evidence requests, right? So as you can imagine, um, there are tens of thousands of these types of law enforcement requests a year. Um, just directed to Microsoft, let alone to Facebook and Google and everywhere else. And under the traditional MLAT process, those requests have, would have to be filed to the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice would have to do an administrative process, present it to a U.S. judge, get signed off, and then have it sent to uh, a company, right? Which takes, and David probably knows much better than I do, but it takes forever and it's completely broken. So what the Cloud Act was meant to do was to facilitate the cross-border access to evidence by building kind of a, a supplemental layer on top that allow countries to send requests directly to Microsoft or Google or Facebook, but do so only when there are prerequisites for rule of law, human rights, um, conflicts of law, and all of that. So that at its general level is what the legislation is intended to do. How it came about is a little bit of a different story, um, which I'm happy to delve into, but I also am cognizant of time. So. Yes, so thank yeah. you. I think we have two more questions in three minutes, so please keep your questions short. Uh, sure. Uh, I just wanted to get everyone's general reaction on any prospects of action from Congress, right? Like having watched the Zuckerberg hearings, it, I think it's exposed some gaps in knowledge, perhaps. Uh, um, <laughs> um, and, and I know that some members tried to sort of test out different regulatory frameworks as, as comparisons. It's, it's very early on, but um, you know, I, I thought there. I, I thought I witnessed some some genuine outrage across the board, but just in terms of practical reality and the politics, just want to get a, a general reaction of you know, is there a future for congressional action? What might that look like? So quickly down. Um, if, I mean, so we, you know, this is we've actually had, as Hassan was just mentioning, some of the most consequential congressional action when it relates to at least digital surveillance and evidence gathering that we've had in in years, if not more than that. Uh, and there was there was. Um, um, also legislation when it came to sex trafficking uh, mm -hmm. recently as well. So there actually have been uh, a su been surprising amount of action considering we're talking about legislation. I think, and, and if you're expecting more, I think actually there may well be more because I think the GDPR's effects in, in Europe mm -hmm. may highlight um, differences in how data is treated here and create pressure as well for, for data breach related legislation in America as well, which has been talked about for many years in lots of proposals, but I actually think that also could potentially be something that we see in the next couple of years. Forgive me if the civil rights community is a little less optimistic. <laughs> um, so I was recently in the Senate uh, working for Senator Leahy um, as of maybe less than a year ago. Um, and uh, you know, I echo David's point. We've seen a surprising amount of activity um, on some of these issues. And I think ultimately what it comes down to is an action forcing um, event, right? And I think at least in the kind of the Fourth Amendment surveillance space, Carpenter is going to be an interesting decision to see what happens there with location information when it comes about. And as David mentioned, GDPR, right? So we're not only looking at action forcing events inside the United States, but what others are doing globally will hopefully inform the debate here and create momentum. So let's see what happens, I guess. Jerry's still out. I'm going to turn it over to you quickly. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Aaron Winhausen. I'm a 3L at University of Missouri with Dean Litsky. We love her. Um, I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, so I'm very disturbed um, by the actions of organizations such as Cambridge Analytica, which seem to be sort of taking part in uh, covert um, sort of social engineering. And um, clearly the sort of the big tech uh, organizations uh, are dubious of government regulation, as they should be, because it sort of goes against the fundamentals of a free and open internet. 
but when you have actors that are working in the shadows to sort of make these massive effects, um, or affect as these massive changes sort of on society as large, at what point do we need to have some sort of oversight um, to ensure that we're not being coerced into a world we don't want to be in? So with that terrific question <laughs> hanging in the air for us to contemplate, uh, I want to thank our panelists. <laughs> so. so we're over time, so thank you very much.